This is Angela and we are here live on location in Atlanta, Georgia. I am here with Lee Sadie Media Group led by Dr. Yolanda Cookie Snipes and today we are interviewing Robbie Wells. He is the nominated presidential candidate for the Independent Party. Now today you're going to hear some amazing information about the topics that we're discussing and that have been mainstream media for a lot of people here in the United States. We're going to be talking about who he is, his life in particular, and the plans he has for this country. One thing you want to know is that he is a single man and the plans that he has for this country are so different from the ones where we've been hearing lately. Pay attention closely because this is one interview you don't want to miss. Mr. Robbie Wells, can yes. you give us a brief synopsis of who you are? Matangelo, I'll be glad to do that. My name's Robbie Wells, an independent candidate for President of the United States, right here from the state of Georgia. Uh, I was an educator and a coach, college football coach, for 20 years. It ended my career at Savannah State University as the head football coach there uh, and retired at the young age of 42 uh, about seven years ago and now here I am uh, with my lifelong dream of running for president. I was actually adopted as an infant here in the state of Georgia uh, and really it's, it's a miracle that I'm even here. You see this beautiful young girl went away to college on a music scholarship right here in the state of Georgia with all of her hopes and dreams ahead of her. She was very talented uh, as a musician, as a singer. And she was actually traveling with the band when she was not in school across the country as the lead singer for this band. Well, like most young girls, she fell in love. The man she fell in love with was older and married and had a family. Mm -hmm. One thing led to another, uh, Charmaine, she got pregnant and everybody was telling her, it's just a blip on the radar, don't ruin your career go ahead and terminate to the point where they set her up an appointment to terminate. And at the last moment, this beautiful young girl said, no, I'm gonna go ahead and give this child a chance at life. I've always said if I ever had a chance to meet that young lady, I would thank her for setting my life in motion because that beautiful young lady is my birth mother. Yes. Back in March, I actually had that opportunity for the very first time right here in the state of Georgia to meet my birth mother. She lives in Cochran, Georgia. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. So Tell us, we really want to know why do you desire to be president of the United States of America? Well, it's, it's, it goes back to when I was eight years old. My, my father was a minister and uh, right here in the state of Georgia, but he also worked with Jimmy Carter when he was the governor of this state. My father sat on a committee that oversaw the special needs kids in the state of Georgia, and it was a great fit because my older sister who has passed away now, she was special needs. So I saw Jimmy Carter as a very young child when he was the governor and then of course when I was eight years old he ran for president and became the president in 1976 and a couple of days before he actually won we were in planes at his home and I remember as an eight-year-old kid looking up at him and said you're gonna be the president of the United States. And he looked down at me and he says one day you will be too. Oh my. Wow. So it just kind of stuck with a kid you know and, and here I am many years later and I'm running. That's awesome. Oh my gosh. But I think I've got a great plan, uh, more so than that, I've got a great plan for our country that is going to bring prosperity back to our land. And it's truly going to give everybody a chance, everybody, a chance at that American dream. So uh, I see a lot of people hurting in this country right now, and I've taken a strong stand. I want the people to rise up with me. Yeah, so why did you choose to run on the independent ticket? Well, if you look at my, my platform, my platform takes the absolute best from the left wing and the absolute best from the right wing. It's not like I'm totally Democrat and it's not like I'm totally Republican. But if you think about it, Latangela, your president is supposed to represent all the people. So if he's just a left wing leaning guy or a right wing leaning guy, He's not representing half the people. So how about a president that sits right there, can see the beauty in both wings, and takes the absolute best so that he can get Congress once and for all working together again and get our people working together again. And that's why I'm an independent. Okay. So what makes you qualify well, to be president? Well, there's a couple of things. I appreciate that. Um, according to the U.S. Constitution, okay, and for all those that are out here listening, let's give them a little Constitution 101 right now. But for those of you that are listening, uh, according to the Constitution, you've got to be at least 35 years old. You have to be born 
in the United States and you have to have lived here for the past 14 years. I fit that criteria. So constitutionally, I am qualified to be president. Outside of that, you'll say, well, you don't have much political experience. Well, I think we're at a point in time where political experience is not the way that most people want to see us go. In fact, it's 68% right now that say they want an independent candidate, a Washington outsider, that will actually go to Washington. So I think we've got a great chance. You know, I really want to know if you're married. I don't see you wearing a ring. I am not married. <laughs> That's a very good question. No, <laughs> no, I am not married. Um, but I would not be the very first single president. James Buchanan was also a single man when he was the president of the United States. And then uh, after him, there's been several presidents that were widowers. Oh yeah, definitely. Yes. I know that to be uh, factual. But let me say this: as a single man, if I was a single man in the White House, okay. There's a couple of things the American people would not have to be concerned with. They would not have to be concerned with my spouse plagiarizing a speech. And then number two, they wouldn't have to be concerned with my spouse lying to Congress and getting impeached. That's tough, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Wow. Okay. We're okay. getting ready to go there. Well, as, as president, would you date while you're in the White House? Well, let me, let me tell you this, uh, Dr. Snipes, there is a beautiful young lady out there. And in the event that this gets very serious with the American people, I will introduce her to the American people at the appropriate time. And I will beg her to go to Washington with me as my first lady. And I believe that a, a White House wedding would be in store. Oh, wow. We'll, we'll get you slide. Let me slide on that one. Okay. Thank you. That, you know, I, that was really interesting that you shared the historical piece uh, with our audience because so sure. many people are not aware of that. And I think right. the more informed we are, the better decisions that we can of make. Course. Um, I'd like to know uh, what would qualify this young lady to be your wife because we really <laughs> need someone that's going to represent this country well. Well, I, I completely agree. Um, and, and not just her, but me, me too. I mean, mm -hmm. you're talking about the first family. I believe that you need people representing this country that truly represents the people and not a corporation. Mm -hmm. And right now, a lot of people in Washington, they don't truly represent the people. So when you're looking at me and anybody in my family, you're going to be looking at someone that's been through the same struggles that 99.6% of America goes through every day. And I say 99.6% because 99.6% of us make less than a million dollars a year. We're considered to be middle class and below. I fall in that category. So if you want to be represented by somebody that's been in the trenches, that knows what it's like to be unemployed, underemployed, knows what it's like to have a great job and lose that job and have absolutely nothing, then I'm probably your guy. Sure, all those personal questions Absolutely. with us. <laughs> I love that you shared your story, and I love being able to know more about you now. And I know the people watching yes, are interested you. in that, too. Um, and you said that the people that are on the tickets currently, many people just don't resonate with them. <clears throat> what advice do you give to the people who are apathetic at this point, who have chosen not to vote at all because they feel like they've only got a couple of options? Angela, I'll, I'll tell you this. There's a reason why 68% of our population has been polled and said that they will vote for an independent over Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. It's unfathomable to think that the nominees of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party is an alleged sexual predator and a lady that's most likely going to be brought up on charges of treason. And I have to ask myself, and I'm sure that every other American, and I'm going to ask you to ask this, this of yourself, is this the absolute best that the Democratic Party and the Republican Party can give us? In my humble opinion, that answer is no, which is why I am running for president. But see, we've got some major problems. You've got, you've got 
new FBI, a new FBI investigation because of all these emails that were found from Anthony Weiner's website. Okay, we all know that his wife is the longtime top aide to Hillary Clinton. We also know that WikiLeaks is putting out all this information about not only Hillary Clinton, but her husband, our former president, Bill Clinton, taking 26 trips to Sex Island on this private jet by Jeff Epstein, okay? So you gotta say to yourself, and, and then they've got the video and they've got all this other stuff they say. So you've got to say to yourself, is that really what we want as, an, as a country to represent us? And you know, I put a challenge out to Hillary Clinton that this coming Monday night, Hillary, with all the information that is coming out against you, and I'm, I'm, I'm challenging you and you alone because I truly believe that this election is probably fixed for it to be handed to you. So I've challenged you, Hillary, uh, to a one-on-one -on -one debate this coming Monday night, the night before the election, at South Carolina State University uh, with a winner take all. But here's what I'm gonna tell you. With all the information that is coming out against you, Mrs. Clinton, I told you a year ago, you and Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who was then the DNC chairman, when you blocked me from the Democratic Party debates a year ago, I said, you're gonna see me then or you're gonna see me later. Well, it's later and here I am. Love that response. Because it feels like so many people right now are, <coughs> are in a midnight season. Right. I remember reading about you in the Huffington Post that was published last year. Sure. Love that article. Thank and you. One of the things you were quoted saying was that the good thing about a midnight season is that it doesn't last long. Mm. That's right. How does this resonate with you now? Well, Angela, it doesn't last long. And you know, it's not too late for us to get it right as a nation. It's really not. And here's what I mean we've actually got a strategy to win the White House in 2016 if we can get the word out to the people quick enough. There's actually eight states right now that we are going after, and I will be a write-in candidate. Those states are Oregon, Wyoming, Iowa, Alabama, New Jersey, Delaware, New Hampshire, and Vermont. And here's what I'm gonna tell you, Mrs. Clinton. I'm going hard after those states. I'm gonna do everything in my power to make sure that I get enough electoral votes to keep you from getting 270. Because if I can keep you from getting 270, then the Congress has to decide who our next president is. Now, our Congress is a majority Republican, so I don't think that Hillary would be voted in by our Congress. But I don't think that Donald Trump would be either, because I don't think there's any Democrat that would vote for him, and there's probably 75% of the Republicans in Congress, they haven't even endorsed him. So they wouldn't vote for him either. So America, I'm telling you right now, if we can win enough electoral votes, we can win this election by default. Mm -hmm. Now I understand that you went after the presidential candidacy some time ago. I did. 2011, 2012, and you're doing it again now. Yeah. I think that's amazing. What is it that inspires you and motivates you to keep going day after day? The people, um, this past year, we've been all across the country, literally in, I believe, 39 states now. Um, but it's the people and the, and the stories that you hear, Angela, from, from everyone all across this, this country. Some great stories, some that are heartbreaking. But it lets me know that there's people out here across this country that are counting on me to stand up for them, which is what I'm doing. A lot of people live here that are very, very proud to be Americans. I'm one of them. Me too. Matter of fact, one of my favorite quotes is, if you want to get there fast, go along. If you want to go far, go together. Right. Can you share with us just a little bit what kind of systems and strategies you have <clears throat> to ensure that we're bring, what, bringing wealth and prosperity <clears throat> back here to the states? Okay, Angela. My plan is called Eaglenomics. It takes the best from the left wing and right wing. It's a plan that will bring prosperity back to our land with structured solutions to bring back millions of manufacturing jobs that we've lost because of poor trade agreements that Hillary Clinton supported and her husband actually signed it to law. Uh, it's a plan that also creates millions of jobs to improve our infrastructure. It's a plan that creates millions of jobs to achieve sustainable energy independence, which gets us out of all the wars in the Middle East. And it cleans up our environment. Because you know what, Angela? We only have one planet. There's not a planet B out there for us to go to. So we better take care of this one. But my plan also has a component 
that makes college education free, all the way to a bachelor's degree, and it eliminates the $1.3 trillion in student loan debt. <clears throat> so when you look at that, I truly think I've got a great plan. And all those Bernie Sanders supporters that are out there that are going, well, Bernie's out of the race. In fact, you know, the emails prove that Hillary had some home cooking with the DNC, the former DNC chair, to make sure that she won that thing. To all you Bernie Sanders supporters out there, I'm going to tell you this. You've got a candidate. I'm running right now. I'd love to get your support. And I'm, they're going to give it to you, too. I, I fully believe in that. The last thing I want to ask you okay. is <clears throat> what advice do you have for people out there who actually have not even followed this election? They haven't, they, they don't feel like they're a part of this country at all. What is the one thing you would say to them to not only get them to the polls before it's too late, but to actually cast their ballot in, in um, hopes of having someone like you as the president? Well, it's a very good question. And it's a great question because the two candidates that you see on TV, nobody relates to because they're both multimillionaires. America, I'm going to tell you this right now. If you're looking for a candidate that you can relate to that's been through the same struggles, if you're looking for someone that's been an educator, that understands the problems with education and how to fix those problems, how to fix the problems that we have with our health care system, uh, a, a person that has a plan to have universal child care, then you're looking at that candidate, uh, a candidate truly for the people. Because you see, all these other candidates, they're tied to all these special interest groups. And people say, oh, Donald Trump's not tied to a special interest group. Yeah, he is. He's tied to his own special interest group. He has all his goods made in about 12 different countries. And he's going to keep doing that and selling out the American people. Okay? Hillary Clinton's tied to all these special interest groups. She's tied to all these nations that have put in millions of dollars. In fact, people have asked, does she want to be the president of the United States or president of the Middle East because of all the money she's taken from Saudi Arabia and all these other Middle Eastern countries? But I'm going to tell you this, America. I've got one special interest group, and it's called 330 million Americans. My special interest group is you. I love it. I'm going to turn it over to Charmaine. Okay, Charmaine. Before we get to Charmaine, sure. I have a few questions <clears throat> sure. for the people. Which people are you talking about? Are you talking about the people who I come in contact on a daily basis? Now, if you're talking about the people I come in contact with, sure. as an educator of 18 years, teaching children that are from, uh, let's say, low income situations, yes. where there are so many social issues that we have to address before I can even teach. How are you going to help me, this person, in well, my and, community? And I understand your question. And the reason I can truly understand where you're coming from is because I was an ed educator myself in a couple of schools that were low-income, poverty-stricken areas, just like what you're dealing with. Um, in fact, one of the schools uh, was in Williamsburg County in, in South Carolina. And to this day, some of the students there, they don't even have electricity at their home. They don't have running water. So you're talking about a situation where people are definitely lacking. Uh, what I'm going to tell you is this. I understand those problems. I understand uh, the needs that these schools and, and these children have. But I think the best thing that we can do is we can put the knowledge right in front of them at their fingertips. A lot of these schools right now, they don't have the budget to keep, it, keep those kids up with kids that are in districts that, that have the money to go get the computers for everybody. As president, I think that you need somebody that's going to go work with the Facebooks and the YouTubes and, and all these other social, social media outlets to say, hey, look, let's take this county right here and let's make sure that every student here gets a laptop or gets a tablet uh, so that they can have all this knowledge right at their fingertips. And what about educators? Most educators are living paycheck to paycheck. I've and been one of them. Right, and, and it's a service that is needed. <clears throat> yes. But it is becoming a personal and professional challenge for many educators. It, it really is. In fact, uh, what you see is young educators will get into the business for a couple of years realize they're not making any money, there's too many restrictions on them, and then they get out. 
right. because they're going to go make the money. Uh, we've got to do a better job. The only way that we can as a government is to increase our tax base because think about this. Our educators are paid with taxpayers' money, correct? Well, there's only so much taxpayer money out there. So you need a plan that's going to actually triple our tax base. And that's what mine does. By creating millions of jobs and bringing back millions of good paying jobs, okay, versus minimum wage. I don't care if they raise minimum wage to $15. It's still minimum wage. It's the minimum amount that somebody has to pay you. Let's create millions of good paying jobs. So by doing that, we triple our tax base, which in turn raises the salaries for teachers, policemen, firemen, all those that are in the public service. And also, what happens with our veterans? It seems like so many <coughs> of our veterans are being swept under the rug. <coughs> They're facing uh, mental issues, right. social issues. What do we do with those resources besides sweep them under the rug and just wait for them to just fade to black? Well, the veterans are near and dear to my heart because I am a veteran. Now, I never served uh, overseas in a war. And I thank God for that because a lot of my buddies went and they didn't come back. Uh, I did go in uh, 10 years ago when I was 38 years old into the Army National Guard during the middle of the wars with Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, I had always told my students that to consider going into the military because it was such a noble profession. I had a little bit of time and I said, it's time for me to put up or shut up. So I did. Um, what I will say is this, our veterans and our military personnel, I should say, we do a great job in our government of training our, our military personnel to go and, and fight for our freedom. We just don't do a great job of training them to come back to civilian life. Correct. Okay? Under my plan, we're going to double the amount of people in the VA, number one. Number two, I am going to push that every veteran has free health care at any facility whether it be public or private across this country, okay? Then, once we have that in place, we're gonna take our, our VA centers and we are going to transi transition them into PTSD centers or specialized centers strictly for them. But we've gotta do a much better job. And here's, here's the last thing I'll say about our veterans. There are two terms that should never be used in the United States. Unemployed veteran, okay, and a homeless veteran. And we're going to do everything in our power to stop that. Okay, and last but not least, yeah. you know, a lot of things become fads. And then when they become sure. fads, everyone starts raising money. Right. That money somewhat disappears. Right. Um, one issue I would like to bring up, and I know a lot of money has been raised for, but I don't know where the accountability is um, with Black Lives Matter. How do you feel about the campaigns that are, are taking place and even the issues? Well, I, I, I think it's okay that, that we have uh, people that are going to stand up with their First Amendment right uh, to speak out when, when things are not right. Obviously, we've got some major problems with, our, with a racial divide in this country, or you wouldn't have Black Lives Matter if there was not a problem. In fact, a good friend of mine is John Fitzgerald. John Fitzgerald is one of the leaders of Black Lives Matter. Uh, he's also running for President uh, of the United States. Uh, but I don't think he's going after Hillary Clinton like I am. But, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say this. I've spoken at two Black Lives Matter rallies mm -hmm. in Phoenix and in Atlanta. I'm also the only presidential candidate that attended the ceremony that removed the Confederate flag from the South Carolina State House grounds. I'm also the only presidential candidate that spoke of the, on the weekend of Million Man March in Washington, D.C. at the National Press Club. And I'm the only presidential candidate that has talked about making reparations to the Afri African American population and to the Native American population for the atrocities that's been done to those people. Okay? Because here's the thing. We're all one people. And we've got to start acting like it. But the only way you're going to get that is to have the right leadership at the top. Because without the right leadership at the top, nobody else is going to follow. But with the proper leadership at the top, Everybody that's following is going to emulate their leader. Sounds good to me. Sure. Well, I just want to right, say Charmaine. I love your passion and your um, 
just your energy around this election. Um, but want to ask you just a few um, final questions. Mm -hmm. um, as the election is coming to a close. Yes. And if you are not selected as the President of the United States, right. what would be the plan B for you and your team? Well, let me just say this. You know, you, you always want to have a plan B. Um, but at this point in time, we are focused directly on the people of this country. Uh, I have many opportunities that I'm going to be able to look at. Uh, but at this point in time, and we're going to get through this coming Tuesday mm -hmm. and the election. But at this point in time, we are focused mainly and solely on the people of this country. Because there is so much corruption that we have seen that has been uncovered by not only the FBI, but by WikiLeaks, by Anonymous, by all these groups that are out there. In fact, you know, let's get back and let's talk briefly about uh, what's come out on WikiLeaks. This plane by Jeff Epstein. Now, Jeff Epstein is a billionaire banker that has been convicted of pedophilia. Um, his plane was used to take President Clinton at least 26 times to Sex Island down in the Bahamas, where underage children, okay, were subjects, sex slaves, to all the people that were there. So you got to say, you know, what is going on? In fact, the plane that was actually used, once they brought down Epstein, they tried to sell this plane on the market very cheap. In fact, they came to my campaign back in January and tried to sell me this plane. I didn't realize what the plane was. But now I'm putting two and two together. The plane's coming out. They're showing pictures of this plane. And it's the actual plane that they tried to get us to take. But I've always heard this phrase. If it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. <laughs> so we passed. All right. Your <laughs> all right, all right. Okay. And I know we're live with um, Facebook and sure. recording, and you have the attention. Not sure. saying you have the endorsement of everyone watching. What do you have to say to get the endorsement or I wanna, the continued I, attention of those that are watching right now? I want to say this to every American right now whether you are black or white, young or old, male or female, gay or straight, Democrat, Republican, independent like myself. Whether you are a Protestant, a Catholic, a Mormon, an agnostic, a Muslim, an atheist, or those of the Jewish faith, we are all very unique in this country. We can celebrate our differences because we have one common bond. We are all Americans. And it's time for us to lay aside our petty differences. It's time for us to start working hand in hand, side by side, to restore this country to the greatness that it can be. It's time for us to stare down the fear of our differences with the face of courage. I'm going to ask each and every one of you one more time. Do you really think that the Democrats and the Republicans have given you the absolute best person that needs to be leading this country? I truly don't think that the answer is yes, which is why I'm running and why I'm asking each and every one of you to write my name in, in that ballot box, Robbie Wells, this coming Tuesday. May God bless each and every one of you.